Good evening, everyone. My on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our next virtual event with Dr. Susanna Rodriguez Dreese here to discuss her new book, Until We're Fish, with Dr. Christina Garcia. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future and you can more about them on our website by signing up for our email newsletter as well as following us on social media at Book Soup. And our next event is scheduled for next Wednesday p.m. Same way with Rachel True and Cree Summer to discuss Rachel's new memoir and tarot deck, True Heart Initiative, or sorry, Intuitive. And tonight's event will end with a QA. To submit a question, please use the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. It's right next to the chat bar at the bottom to the left. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, you can click the like button and it'll bump it up in the queue. And we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, please support Book Soup. It's a very tough time for independent bookstores, so we appreciate you joining us in any capacity. But if you want to support our bookstore and our authors this evening by purchasing a copy of tonight's book, which you can do by clicking the green button below right here, and it'll open it up in a new window, and it won't interrupt the program. So you can do that at any time this evening, and it will redirect you to our website where you can finish your checkout process. So with that said, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for this evening in the beginning, and I will come back and introduce Christina and Susanna later. Um, we're actually starting this evening with a really fun performance from Makina Loca, and I'm going to introduce Ricardo Lembo, who, inter er, who leads Makina Loca. So I'm going to do that now. So Ricardo Lembo has established himself as a pioneer with his innovative blend of Afro-Cuban rhythms with Pan-African styles, has been described by the Los Angeles Times as seamless and infectious. Lembo hails from São Salvador de Congo, Zaire in northern Angola. He came to the U.S. more than 30 years ago to pursue a law degree, but ended up devoting his life to music. Lembo is the multicultural embodiment of the Afro-Latin diaspora, which connects back to Mother Africa via the Cuban clave rhythm. Since forming his Los Angeles-based band Makina Loca in 1990, Lembo has refined his craft and vision, raising his joyous voice with strength, singing songs that celebrate life, and most importantly, inspiring his audiences to let loose and dance away their worries. I just realized I should bring Ricardo back while I'm reading this. Lembo has been the subject of various radio and television programs, including BBC Radio, NPR, NBC Today Show, and many more. Through the years, Lembo has performed countless shows in many festivals, nightclubs, and performing art centers throughout Europe, the Americas, Africa, and Australia with seven albums that have been enthusiastically acclaimed by both print and broadcast media worldwide, including film. His latest album, Endona Ponte, was just released October 6th this week and is a tribute to his great grandmother. So we're so excited to bring Ricardo on really quick to introduce Makina Loca, and then we're gonna have a few performances and then we will get into our conversation. Thank you, Ricardo, for being with us. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Ricardo Lembo. I am the lead singer of the group Machina Loca. I am excited to share two traditional Cuban songs to celebrate the launch of Until We're Fish. Tonight, I will be accompanied by three talented musicians. On guitar, Stephanie Amaro, on tres, Andy Abad, and Alfred Ortiz on bongo. This is a live uh, pre-recording that took place last Saturday, uh, especially for this event. And I hope that you enjoy it. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. 
That was a gorgeous way to kick off this event. It was wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to introduce Christina and Susanna now, unless you have any last words, Ricardo. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this launch party. And please <laughs> buy the book. Yes, buy the book and get Ricardo's new album. And thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> Bye, Susanna.
All right, now I'm going to introduce our guest speakers for this evening, starting with Susanna Rodriguez Drisi, who is an award winning writer, poet, playwright, translator, and scholar. Her poetry, prose, and academic papers have appeared or are forthcoming in journals and anthologies such as In Season, Stories of Discovery, Loss, Home, and Places in Between, which won the 2018 Florida Book Award, Publishers Weekly, another one which comes Monday. The Los Angeles Review of Books, Miami Herald, Nuevo Herald, Sao Palm, Literal Magazine, Diario de Cuba, Madrid, SX Salon, Raising Mothers, The Ascentos Review, and Cuba Counterpoints, among many others. Her musical, Nocturno, will premiere this winter in Miami, directed by Victoria Colado of John Leguizamo's Latin History for Dummies, musical direction by Jesse Sanchez of Hamilton the National Tour, and produced by George Cabrera, of 3FEO Entertainment. Rodriguez Drisi is the author of The Latin Poet's Guide to the Cosmos of Floricanto Press in 20, 2019 and is on the faculty of the writing programs at the University of California, Los Angeles. The novel she will be discussing and reading from tonight has been nominated for the National Book Award, the National Critics Circle Award, the Penn Open Book Award, and the Penn Hemingway Book Award for debut novels, which is amazing. Congratulations, and thank you for being with us. And our other speaker tonight is Cristina Garcia, an assistant professor of Spanish and Latin American and Caribbean Studies at the College of Charleston. She received her MA in Humanities and Social Thought from New York University and her PhD in Spanish and Portuguese from the University of California, Irvine. In her research of literary and visual works from the Hispanophone Caribbean, she considers how particular aesthetic techniques can provide alternative forms of imagining the physical body and its environment. Most recently, her work appeared in the Cuban Studies Journal, as well as the edited volume, Exploring Animal Encounters. At present, she is working on her book manuscript titled Corporeal Readings and Inhuman Art, Material Ecologies of a Cuban Imagination. We are so excited to have these two brilliant women with us tonight. So please, um, this would be round of applause time if we were in person. And thank you both so much for being with us. And everyone, um, thanks for joining us and sit back, relax, and enjoy. Um, Samantha, thank you so much for that introduction. And hello, uh, BookSoup audience. I'm so excited for our conversation with Susana Rodriguez Drisi. Susana, amiga querida, I am honored and privileged to be part of your book launch. So thank you. Thank you, Christina. The honor is absolutely mine. Um, I am thrilled to be here with everyone. So excited to share my work with you tonight. Um, thank you, Samantha and BookSoup for um, this event. And eternally grateful to Ricardo Lembo um, and Makina Loca for opening up um, tonight's celebration. I hope you enjoy it by the book, by Christina's books. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fantastic set. So I'll start with the description of the novel before we dive into the questions. Um, until We're Fish is a novel with a narrative thread that is captivating, one the reader can easily follow. Um, it's also complexly textured with poetic knots to unravel, with a quixotic protagonist who works in a textile factory and a wife who pulls and plugs the telephone cords that make conversations happen. Until We're Fish relishes in intertextual references and draws from novelistic traditions. Its setting is the island nation of Cuba, 1959, 1980, and 1994, each a year of mass exodus. As such, the novel is about abandonment, about the abyss that expands and contracts between people, between friends, romantic partners, parents, and their children. But it's also about dreams, fabulous tales, black and white, checkered marble floors, catalogs, and aquariums. It's about transformations, the fear of becoming strange and the extraordinary freedom in allowing oneself to do so. Susanna, I wanna begin by asking you about how you weave recognizable historical events with interpersonal relationships. And the word fish includes a great range of experiences, but ultimately focuses on the impact of sociopolitical, the 1959 Cuban Revolution, and even natural forces, heat, hurricanes, floods, 
on individual lives. In other words, this is a story that focuses on the ways in which outside forces determine the intimate, but also difficult, dysfunctional aspects of relationships. Why choose these individual lives to talk about these monumental historical events? Thank you, Christina. That's a wonderful question. And thank you for the beautiful, the beautiful introduction to the, the black and white checkered uh, floors uh, get me. <laughs> um, so why these individual lives uh, in particular to show these, these grand historical events, the impact of these historical events? Um, I think I, I have always been interested, not necessarily on the events themselves, but precisely how people are affected by those events, how their private lives may or may not reflect what's going on outside. And in the case, in the case of these um, of these characters, people like um, Elio, the protagonist, but also Maria and their friend, um, their friend Pepe, Sabelita, Manolito, um, you know, the old woman across the street who we don't like very much, Teresa, um, but who's definitely present and part of the, the drama that they're living through. Um, they're all people who are struggling precisely with the ways in which these historical events manifest in their lives. So the the very tensions that we see taking place outside, the political, cultural, um, the, the social tensions outside of their home, visit them very, very closely, right? So, so much so that um, their, their marriage, the marriage between Elio and Maria really is... is uh, a reflection or an echo of what's happening in the revolution. So if if um, if it's the time of the honeymoon for the revolution, the very first few years of the revolution, um, uh, Maria and Elio are also enjoying their honeymoon. And we see throughout the novel, um, their marriage sort of um, change. It, it hasn't disintegrated yet, but it, it's, it changes with the ebb and flow of revolutionary ideals, um, with revolutionary failures. So um, there's no point really for me writing a novel about revolution if we're not going to see, and this is really not a novel about revolution, it's a novel about people who happen to live through, um, through a revolution or a, a moment of great political and social tension. Right, absolutely. And I think, and also in these personal lives and these stories also give a certain texture and a different understanding to these monumental events that we sometimes assume to have uh, an understanding of. They give it a certain complexity. Um, I want to ask you, so Elio, he steals books while Maria stops reading altogether. What is the role of books in reading in the novel? Why, what might you be suggesting by alluding to novels such as Madame Bovary, uh, The Count of Monte Cristo, among others? Um, and of course, there are there are many others. There's there's also um, um, you know um, Jules Verne's novels, and and there's Don Quixote, which has a a, um, a huge place in how um, how Elio understands the world. Um, books are everything, I think, um, and, and they were everything for me. Um, so, you know, it, this is really my experience, I think, with books growing up in Cuba, growing up on an island where there wasn't very much, um, where storytelling was everything. Either, you know, I would hear stories from my grandmother, so oral storytelling um, from my dad, from my mother, rumors. Um, things that you couldn't necessarily um, pin down, but words that were in the air. Um, and books, you know, my mom was a librarian. Books became very much for me uh, a way to escape um, precisely the, the kinds of, of tensions that we were living through. And for, for a kid, I think um, it's a wonderful way to escape. For Elio and, and Maria, um, for Maria specifically, you know, novels such as uh, Madame Bovary, um, it's, it's sort of, we were talking about it before, and it's sort of a box within a box, right? Madame Bovary is someone also who is fascinated by books and, and, uh, and storytelling. Um, and so it's, it's a way to, to echo all of the emotions and desires that these characters um, may have or may feel and, and uh, are enabled to fulfill through 
other desires and and um, other dreams of other characters. So I think by using other books in in the text, I'm enriching characterization, you know, um, mm -hmm. and I'm also um, I'm also creating this this very thick sort of um, fabric where where we have um, references outside of the book. So it creates not only an escape for the characters themselves, but an escape for the reader. Um, for the reader as well, because the, the novel can be at times uh, a bit claustrophobic, I, I feel a little bit, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're on an island, we're confined, that kind of thing. Um, the, the books uh, represent everything that they're, that they, they're dreaming about. It's, mm -hmm. it's a world of possibility, um, a world of illusion. Um, and fortunately, you know, while one continues to pursue the, uh, the books, the other one comes to understand that the reality that they're living doesn't lend um, itself to books. And so books are no longer something that, that um, are fulfilling, become fulfilling for her. No, and I'm glad that you mentioned the storytelling. I mean, it definitely seems that the books become a way, well, the books and then also all of the conversations and all of the other, there's all these other uh, spaces for narrative. And it seems to be a way to, um, to face the abandonment um, or even more mundanely as one of the character protests of uh, being bored to death. Um, so as a way to uh, face boredom or even postpone death. But I wanna, um, I'm thinking about the storytelling and there's a great exchange that's early in the marriage when Elio and Maria are at the beach. Could you read a passage from chapter 13? Yeah, sure, I love that chapter, okay. I have to put on my handy dandy glasses. Um, okay, so this is um, this is chapter uh, thirteen, and it's it's been about um, four weeks or so since Elio and Maria um, were married, and they're at the beach. A month and a day after their wedding, the sun was high and the sea was a glittering blue as Elio and Maria walked to the shore at Baracoa Beach. A surge of large, smooth waves came toward them, frothing up around their feet. They held hands and kissed, letting the ground sink beneath them as the waves pulled back into the sea. Come on, Maria said. We didn't come here for nothing. She was standing on one foot with her arms outstretched, playing burnt flamingo under the sun. Her skin had turned a bright red and Elio feared she'd had enough sun for one day. He stared out toward the quiet menace that was all that water, a machine with machine-like creatures lurking beneath the surface. He didn't have the heart to swim. He simply couldn't do it. His legs wouldn't move. His body wouldn't budge. He was terrified. You go, he told her, even as his heart beat fast for her and for what he knew could happen in the water. Come on, don't be a ninny, she said, hopping, laughing, and pulling him by the hands. Elio could do nothing more than hold his ground. No, he said, lifting her hands to his mouth to kiss them. I'm not getting in the water. Fine, she said, pulling her hands away. I'll go in alone this time, but you'll have to get over your fear sooner or later. Elio watched as her body broke the waves and disappeared into the sunlight. He walked back to their towel and sat down. While he waited impatiently for her to come back, he tried to read, but his head was nowhere near Lincoln Island and the Nautilus. It was with Maria, and he hoped, prayed, she'd come back from the water in one piece. He felt sick to his stomach. They spent all afternoon at the beach telling each other stories. He, the one about the guy who found a cave full of gold and silver and precious stones. She, the one about the magic lamp, and the other one, the one about the sailor. Then she said, they should start with the greatest book ever written in any language. Once you read it, you'll never be the same, she said. And she told him about windmills and giants and about the greatest of friendships between a caballero andante and his squire and about the caballero's unbounded love for his Dulcinea. Elio was mesmerized by the lull of her voice. This will be a story long enough to last us all the years we'll spend together, Maria told him. Elio loved the idea and he loved her. She told each story with great care, tenderly, quietly, rounding out every word as though each time was the first and the last time she pronounced había una vez. Sitting beside her on the sand, Elio concluded that Maria knew all there was to know about loving him. Perhaps she could guess that
that as long as there were words and as long as there were stories that he would want to hear again the next day and the next and the next day after that, she would save him. And there would be no other destination than Maria because she would be the only place he would ever want to be, his one and only story. And they'd made so many plans, which they erected before them like sandcastles, as elaborate as the stories they told and just as beautiful. They decided where and how they would live, who their friends would be and what they would wear and eat and watch on TV, and how they would never let anyone dictate their lives or make choices for them or make them feel unwelcome or afraid because they were young and this life was new and like all new things, they were wrapped up in dreams. Though he tried to remember the finer details of his story, colors, sounds, and textures, his mind drew a blank, choosing instead to imagine Maria choking and swallowing water. Absorbed in the one task of getting another breath, her body flailed hopelessly against a force she couldn't see. Unable to wait any longer, Elia ran to the shore and looked out over the water. Children waded in and out of the surf while a small blue motorboat crawled slowly toward the pier. Elio couldn't see anybody on it, and he couldn't see Maria in the water. His heart beat faster. He pushed into the surf far enough for the water to reach his scaffs, but he froze. He couldn't go any further. Maria, his voice came out broken. Swim back. A beat, then another, and suddenly there she was in the distance. Maria, a small dot in the sea of sunlight, saw him and waved. Elio waved back, squinting. I think you should get out of the water, he shouted his heart pumping in his chest. I'm coming, she yelled back. That's such an incredible passage. Um, so the, just thinking, listening to you hear, read it now, the juxtaposition between the narrative and the storytelling and the dream and the vulnerability of the body and fear. Um, but more specifically, I wanna ask you, um, so as that passage in the beast suggests, uh, fish are important. Elio is terrified of entering the water because of an earlier shark attack. And later in the story, he collects fish and builds aquariums. Could you tell us a little bit about the title, Until We're Fish? How do fish express the relationship between humans and the sea? What deeper meaning will water represent for those living on the island? Um, well, water is everything, right? For for an island, we you know we have no borders. So if if you ever want to escape, as um, as Elio says at the very beginning of the novel, um, you can't avoid all that all that water. And it, it you know, I I purposely uh, started the novel at the at the limits of what I think is is represents the island, and that is the seawall, right? Havana's uh, Malecon. And so Elio's staring out into the sea. His father um, has left for Chicago a little bit earlier. It's 1959, days, days before Castro's march into Havana. And, um, and everything, everything really begins there. He meets someone who tells him um, that, um, you know, as Cubans, we're all fish in a barrel, right? Um, and of course, this is, uh, this is interesting to Elio. He thinks that the fisherman is uh, joking um, and uh, Elio figures that, you know, the, the old man tells him that the only way to get out for them to, um, or they can easily be killed rather, um, Cubans, and they're so vulnerable because all anyone has to do is drain the water out and the fish obviously wow. are dead. And so um, what Elio concludes is that he will have to wait for the tide to rise for the fish to be able to um, to escape and water you know water is life right we're we're made of water um, water is um, renewal it's transformation it's rebirth and so from the very beginning of the novel that there's there's this theme of a new life right I, I begin with Dante's um, uh, Dante's quote from the Vida Nuova um, mm -hmm. a new life and so. Um, what does it mean for for these people on this island to have to have this new life? Um, do they ever achieve it? And um, the answer is probably no, right? We know that that's that that's not the case. But for Elio, he he understands that there's hope in that water, and if he can only get back to the water, he can get back to 
um, an understanding of himself. He can under, uh, uh, get back to to significance, to meaning, um, to some kind of of redemption. And so, fish become the representation of that, the symbol of this kind of um, of this kind of hope. Um, he doesn't know what to do with them at first, of course. He begins um, catching them and bringing them home, um, and and he does what he shouldn't do. Um, he imprisons them. He puts them in in aquariums. He he doesn't quite know what to do with these uh, creatures, um, but eventually he begins to understand that there's there's something more in the water, and that and that yes, if he gets back to the water, um, he can get uh, himself back. He can he can own himself. Um, he has he has uh, unfortunately lost himself throughout all these many um, all these many years, and so the water represents everything that. Um, that renewal can bring for him. It's also, um, you know, it's also uh, a middle position, right? You have all of these, all, all of these people um, on the island who are leaving. Elio doesn't necessarily want to want to leave. He doesn't want to follow in his father's footsteps. He's also afraid of the water, um, but the water is is a negotiation between leaving and staying. So, which is really what he wants. He, he wants to be able to leave the island, but he also doesn't want to necessarily come to the United States, right? And so uh, it, it begins to represent that for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and of course, um, the water is also a, a trope for change and fluidity and connectivity, which is right. also sort of the opposite of a wall. It, it's also connects at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this, uh, passage that I love, um, I'm going to read it, quote, Repinga, this was a world <laughs> inventing itself, transforming itself, rising, submerging, and breaking apart. New bodies broke off from the mainland daily, drifting at sea with or without a goddamn compass. The passage continues, but I'll stop there. For a country that is characterized as frozen in time, your novel makes visible the imperceptible changes, the constant transformation. Can you say more um, about how transformation and even metamorphosis work in the novel? Um, so, so change and metamorphosis, transformation, of course, this whole idea of, um, of the fish that we see later on, but you'll have to read, we won't give it away. Um, but, um, you know, transformation and change in the novel uh, take place in, in the in the form of tremors. You know, mm. um, sometimes, as we were saying, that they um, they're imperceptible, but but they're there. That doesn't mean that these characters don't feel trapped. That doesn't mean that time moves very slowly for them. It means that they're so caught up in surviving the everyday that they don't feel those tremors. Um, once in a while, Elio notices that, or he, or he thinks that things are going to change, and he doesn't realize, the novel says, or the narrator says, um, that things are already changing, or that things have already changed, um, right as he begins to understand um, those changes. The names of streets um, change. Everything changes in, um, in a revolution, right? Or everything shifts and nothing changes. Um, everything stays the same, but you have the kind of disorientation that happens when um, there's, there is the possibility of great or the effort toward great transformation. And so you see, um, you know, hotel names that change and businesses, uh, other small businesses that change, street names, um, people who come and go constantly in spite of the fact that Cubans for many years are stuck in this place without the possibility of leaving, um, their faces change and, and Elio registers these changes and it's very painful to him. Maria changes right in front of his eyes, right? And he says that, that people who come from the outside, their faces so powdered and, and uh, smelling like Revlon, um, feel different than the faces of the people who have never left, right? Whose faces, he says, have sort of collapsed like the buildings around him. And so absolutely there's there's so much change, but it's this, this constant um, push and pull between uh, things staying the same and, be, and things changing, right? So um, one of the things that, that Maria uh, 
complains about is the fact that her life hasn't changed very much. The kinds of grand changes that she wants, that she has seen in the in the pages of the Sears, the old Sears catalog um, that circulated in, in Cuba before the revolution, um, they're not there. You know, she wants she wants um, shiny appliances and formica and mm -hmm. and things like that. And to her, you know, that's success. That's the fulfillment of her dream. And it's not that she necessarily wants material things. Is that material things represent a fulfillment of her emotional and psychological needs and um, she's been able to identify those things in in the pages of of the Sears catalog so those you know on the one hand uh, Maria wants things to change and the other hand Elia doesn't want anything to change he doesn't want to leave she wants to leave um, so to me it's it's the constant push and pull and the constant um, the the sort of the awful tension I think that Cubans have always have always felt um, it's, you know, do I leave? Do I go? There is no greater question for a Cuban um, than um, leaving versus staying. Mm -hmm. yeah. And those two, of course, represent changes in themselves. Right, right. No, it's definitely sort of an ambivalent relationship because there's a lot of fear towards that change. And yet that change is also linked to the possibility sometimes of, of, of rebirth. Right. Um, you mentioned the catalog. So I want to ask you, um, American products and a concern for the American way of life are ubiquitous in the novel. What do you think the character's special fondness for the United States suggests about Cuba's relationship with its northern neighbor? I mean, look, um, as, as, uh, <laughs> As uh, I think it was uh, Ricky's uh, Ricky's dad, who, who we'll talk about Ricky later. I, I hope um, tells him, you know, Cubans were born looking north in in many ways, right? Um, Cuba has a, a longstanding relationship to the United States from at least the the 19th century, and so um, I think uh, in general, uh, without taking away what's what's ours and all of our individual aspirations as as Cubans, um, I think Cubans have always aspired to what's American, um, and so we're we're so close to to the United States. And I think it's um, to me it's it's been in in many ways um, both a gift and a curse. Right when mm -hmm. we run away, we run to to the U.S. But um, we also have had to run away and, and that's the curse, right? So um, I think American things represent what is what is um, outside of the island, a better, obviously it represents a, a better life, better taste, um, hope, um, and, and the opposite of whatever may be happening um, on the island. Um, just another option another option. Um, for Maria, it's it's absolutely everything. She sees herself in those pages of the Sears catalog. She learns English from, mm -hmm. um, from the Sears catalog. And um, much like, much like um, you know, Madame Bovary, um, this catalog, the catalog represents also for her a kind of storytelling mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, and, and literature. It's just as dreamlike, just as fascinating to her to see the hairdos and to see the fashions in the Sears catalog, um, as it might be, for example, to experience Emma Bovary's wedding party um, as she's on the bus to, to Cabañas with her, with her grandmother. So um, the United States uh, in, the, in the novel is really, again, a gift and a curse. And not only the United States, um, other cities, other countries, um, you know, other cities like Miami, other cities like uh, Los Angeles or Chicago, or wherever Cubans go, like Barcelona or Madrid, or um, it's uh, you know, it's a shame. I think every Cuban wants to wants to stay, um, but they feel they have no choice but to leave. And so, um, American things represent it once again that pull away from from what's ours, that pull away from the island. But I'm thinking it, um, 
the, I love what you do with the catalog in the novel. It's so playful because she she takes these phrases that are out of context. So it's yeah. even though even though there's this look towards American and the way you prefaced it at the beginning was like, well, it's still Cuban. There's still this. It's what she does with it. So even though it's the Sears catalog, like what she does with it becomes something different. Um, would you read a passage of Maria that expresses her fascination con el norte? Um, I love the scenes of her in the Telefónica. Okay. Um, yeah, I love that too. That's that's from uh, chapter twenty three. Yes. Um, so just to to give a little bit of an introduction. Um, it is September 3rd, 1994, and about a month earlier, an announcement had been made that those who wanted to leave the island would be allowed to do so in any way that they could. For the first time since Mariel thousands took to the, to the sea, clambering onto small boats, homemade rafts, inner tubes, refurbished vehicles, and anything that floated. Uh, Maria's at the telephone company where she works at the Telefonica in, um, in Bauta. Um, and she receives a phone call from Elio's father, who has been living in Chicago for many years, really um, right before um, the triumph of the 1959 Cuban Revolution, and um, from from whom they never uh, receive any kind of um, any kind of phone call or communication, except at those times where there's a kind of opening. And so, uh, for example, during the um, the Mariel boat lift, um, Ricky communicates um, once with them. So let's take a look then at the chapter. Let's see. All right, and it's, um, so it's 1994. It's a special period in times of peace. And I'll read a little bit from the middle of the chapter. It says, she'd been pulling and plugging cords around the clock at a four position manual board for decades. If she felt like only pulling them out now, then that's what she was going to do, pull and plug, a technique most telephone companies had abandoned by the 1950s. But on this island, she was still pulling and plugging. She could have done away with the old board years ago, found a different job. The most days she felt useful. Even when things got rough, she helped people find each other. A brother in Chickaloon, Alaska, hoping to reconnect with a sister in Bejucal, when dengue infected mosquitoes sank their mouth parts into people's necks and recent, a recent divorcee in San Francisco calling in on an old elementary school flame after some light tremors had knocked down a vase from New Guinea. Someone in Delhi responding to a newspaper ad advertising young Cuban brides. And then there was Miami, so many calls from Miami, you'd think an alarm had gone off. Bleep, 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 bleep. Breakups, deaths, births, and cancer all came through her cables. It was she who helped people's lives between finger and thumb. She who made reconciliations possible, who facilitated money transactions, reunited old lovers, and encouraged arguments and mistrust. But it went beyond that because sometimes she listened in. Not to whole conversations, but to snippets. Then she'd pass the time wishing it was she whose voice reverberated through the cables like some rickety roller, co roller coaster. The calls that day had been mostly uneventful. Then in the late afternoon, Pepe's voice came through her cable. Oye, he shouted, tell Elio to meet me at the park tonight. Despite her many gentle indications over the years that he could speak at a normal volume, Pepe was still convinced he needed to belt out his words loud enough to be heard through her cables. I'll let him know, she shouted back. <laughs> she unplugged his line and rubbed her abused ear for a moment, then began working to connect the next call, a long distance exchange. It was a call from Chicago. Her heart started to beat faster. Suddenly, she remembered the promise she'd made to her grandmother, a promise she never intended to keep. She was once again reminded of her childhood dream, of snowy landscapes and lights, so many lights, only lights as far as she could see. She couldn't recall why she started dreaming of Chicago in the first place. Perhaps it was that crunch, crunch, crunch of snow she'd heard amplified in old American films that made Chicago better than Hollywood, better than Miami. Or perhaps it was her darling Sears, the magic and glitter of which she could still remember. She could hardly have known what life had been like in Chicago for Elia's father, one could only guess. 
snow white like talcum powder, like a luxurious blanket over everything, just as she'd seen on TV. How she wished for it today, she wanted to complain to Nena about the heat, Nena is her coworker, Nena about the heat, but she wouldn't have known what to say. So much of it had become vapid and predictable. Just as she was about to pick up a blinking line, Nena wistfully alluded to lunch, trying to get her attention by miming, peeling, and devouring a banana. Operator, Bauta, Maria finally exhaled into the mouth of the receiver. Allo, 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 Ricky Perez here, the voice said. Maria froze for a moment. She thought she would say something, something straightforward, like, we need you to help us. She took a deep breath, then hesitated, and finally, just when she thought she'd get the words out, she simply lacked the courage. Where to, she said. There was a nervous urgency to her voice that she tried to contain by putting her hand on the mouthpiece and catching her breath away from it. Maria had received a few phone calls in her time that surprised the fuck out of her, but this one, this one she never expected. Every few years she'd think of the city. She was in love from afar with this Chicago. The thought moved like one big muscle through her mind, shoving everything else out of the way with a kind of animal grace. She had started dreaming on the day Elia showed her the postcard, or was it earlier? She was in love with Chicago from afar, even as cities like Miami, LA, New Jersey, New York, Paris, Madrid, and Barcelona had ruined the islands for whole, the island for whole generations. Over centuries, Cubans had looked about themselves and seen value only in what was foreign, what was outside of themselves. Yes, it must be true they told themselves. Paris, Madrid, and Barcelona must be better than this small island. Miami, LA, New Jersey, New York, and Chicago must all be better than this. There was confirmation of it all around them in t-shirt logos and canned food items, movies, and phone calls, long distance phone calls. Everyone waited for them, putting up with echoes and cut off conversations. Long distance phone calls had replaced cassettes and letters laced with starched and ironed dollar bills, 18 karat gold chains as fine as thread. She had no relatives abroad, so she had to make do with other people's conversations and code. Again and again, Chicago had appeared in the margins of her life without influencing in the least its basic text. Lately though, she thought of it more and more, thoughts illuminated by movie marquees, hotel signs, and all that snow. But the leaving seemed possible once again, Elio wasn't going anywhere. He was staying put, wasting motion as if it would go on forever, as if to spin one's wheels was to go somewhere. That's it. Great. Um, the Telefonica and the textile factory where Elio works, are they actual places? Until Where Fish takes place in Bauta, Cuba, the town where you grew up. I suppose you must have many memories of your life there. Do you return often? Why do you think it was important to write about your hometown? Okay, um, thank you for that question, Christina. Um, it was important to me for it to be grounded um, in the specificity of place. Um, and so for it to really reflect um, my actual experience, I look, there's, there's nothing wrong. I mean, literature and fiction are all about imagination. And we have absolutely the right to imagine places and write about places where we've never been. But I think, you know, I, I think having been to the place, having lived in the place, having been born in the place, um, it, in some way, there, there's that umbilical cord that, that still exists somewhere um, invisible, but it's, it's there, right? So it brings a kind of, um, I don't want to say authentic, authenticity, but it brings a kind of um, true, ex true experience um, mm -hmm. to, to the writing process. So for me, it, it was cathartic to be able to, to write about the place where I was born um, and, and where I grew up, you know, um, un until, until we left in 1981. Um, and also for the reader, I, I think the reader, hopefully, I, I hope that the reader can tell the difference that, that there's a kind of um, there's a kind of emotion in every in every phrase and every description that there's that there's so much love um, and real connection 
behind um, the ways I've chosen to, um, uh, I guess, to talk about Bauta, you know, um, a place that for me had uh, has a lot of um, ugly experiences and, and mm -hmm. many of which are in the book, by the way, um, but also beautiful experiences. You know, childhood, I, I think, is, is magical in many ways, and we tend to grow, not necessarily grow out of our trauma. I'm still working it out, obviously, in, in all of these various forms, but um, you tend to, to polish it, you know, with some kind of golden hue. Um, and there's a little bit of that in the novel. There's a scene um, that we, we won't have time to read, but there's a scene with the mangoes and, and going to a tumbar mangoes, you know, to knock down mangoes. And um, what's, we don't have that kind of childhood anymore. So if there's any nostalgia at all in this novel, it's not necessarily um, for what was, um, definitely not for what was before mm -hmm. the revolution. And it, it's, uh, it's nostalgia for childhood in some sense, mm -hmm. you know, for this kid who's longing for a bike and um, for the dream that hasn't been fulfilled, but that we hope one day will for, for the mangoes that he knocks down, um, for the kind of hopeful um, exuberance that, that, uh, that they experience as children, right? His love for Maria, his love for his friend that he eventually loves, right? His friend Pepe. Um, so, um, I mean, it, it's very much about place. There's the, it, the, the novel doesn't spend too much time in Havana. I think Cuban American, mm -hmm. um, Cuban American literature and Cuban literature has spent way too much time in, in Havana. And so, um, we, although we begin in Havana, um, we only stay there for a very short period. And, um, and then we go right into Bauta. And Bauta, of course, um, a lot of people haven't heard of it. Um, but it's also the place where Lesama Lima had his, uh, his um, famous uh, group, you know, no. Origenes. And so it has a long history to um, the, the little church where he goes and, and he climbs up to the bell tower. Um, that is the church where, where they would, uh, the Origenes group would meet. So it has a long intellectual oh, wow. history, a very rich intellectual history. Um, and hey. Well, uh, I've just placed myself <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, you know, I, I wanted to put it on, on the map um, beyond that, because not too many people know about that. And I'm, I'm hoping that people read it, if anything, um, because of Bauta. When they go to Cuba, um, they only stay a very short time in Havana um, and uh, they, they, they walk, they go on foot um, mm. for the five or six hours that it may take them in the heat and, and walk to Bauta. Um, it's a, it's a poor, um, it's a poor little town with um, people who have gone through a great deal. So yeah, the, the pony guy is real, like the textile factory is real <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah. so would you say um, that, that being away from your hometown, would you say that your writing comes from a need to narrativize what you lived there what about what you knew of life then made you want to write it down or give it, give it some order, give it voice? Um, so, I mean, I, I remember so much. I, I have really a great memory when it comes to, you know, things that we have lived and we tend to remember even more the things that have, that have traumatized you, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, I think for me, there were a lot of question marks, a lot of wanting to understand um, not only what was what had taken place in our lives when while we were there, um, but also, you know, going back to the very first question that you asked me about the, the great historical events influencing individual lives, you know, I wanted to know, you know, how these things and why and, you know, the greatest, one of the greatest questions was how this has impacted family dynamics, for example, um, the leaving versus staying, the politics, the, um, which is not so, um, it's not so um, relevant to the story in this case that um, they don't talk about necessarily politics, um, the characters, but um, all of these things were important for me to understand how they had come about um, 
why they're, you know, uh, one relative may talk to another one, but may not talk to the third one. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of, of distrust, you know, um, between, between relatives over so many years of cut off conversations. The telephone was important to me because that, that has been um, either, it has always been important, whether it's been present or not, mm -hmm. whether it has been um, accessible to Cubans or not. So communication, miscommunication, all of right. these things were knots that I felt I needed to, to unravel um, mm -hmm. and uh, to really to know myself, to, to answer questions for myself. Um, the greatest question though has, has always been, what is this fascination? You know, what is this fascination with, with the United States, our closest, uh, our closest neighbor? Um, and what does that mean? Right. Mm -hmm. So um, Maria is super important in that sense. And every time they're, these characters are finding some kind of, or come to some kind of, of peace or calm with whatever situation there is, you get the phone call from outside, right? Pulling them out again. And yeah. so um, that's, that's the knock at the door. You know, re remember me, your, your uh, Northern neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so um, again, the, the gift and the, the gift and the curse. Um, right. But yeah, it's really to understand, you know, uh, begin with the why and go from there. How the did you, that helped. yeah. So did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? How did that um, happen? No, I mean, I always knew I was a reader. I, I love to read and I, I, um, I, always, I always understood that at some point, whatever, whatever it was that I read, I would need to somehow um, vomit, you know, to say it, to say it crassly. Um, but yeah, digest you know, it and vomit. Digest it and put it out there. Yeah, um, yeah. it's, it's uh, inevitable, I think, you know, when you start collecting, collecting stories, you know, Elio eventually, I, I dream of Elio as, as a, a writer at some point, I think eventually, Either he or, or Maria would end up mm -hmm. um, would end up writing, right? They've they've read and they love storytelling and they have so much to tell. So um, I didn't always know that I wanted to be a writer. I know I was a reader, and I figured eventually I would write. I really um, I wanted to be an artist. I started off that route, you know, um, went to school for that, you know, started off my my BA. Um, as a design and fine arts uh, major. And then, um, you know, <laughs> what ended up happening, like for example, I remember a, a specific class, ceramics class, you know, I, I had made this, um, this uh, beautiful plate and it was these two, it was sort of uh, a Romeo and Juliet kind of faces and very pretty, but in, on the back of it, I had written a story, right? And so, you know how you etch it in or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the instructor came and he said, oh, this is, so, this is so interesting. You should do more pieces like this where you, you, know, you do on one side and on the other side or on the front. You write, and I was like, sure, whatever, you know. But I think that was the beginning, you know, the beginning of something. Um, I was about 17 then. And then, you know, I started writing poetry first. So it was always poetry for me first and for most. Um, then I started trying out, um, short stories, of course, and, um, other things. And, uh, yeah. And I, have never looked back. I, I do love design. I love art. I, I, um, worked for Mattel and Disney for a while. Um, and so I, I have some background in that and I continue to do certain things in particular in, um, uh, in the area of like graphic design and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned the poetry and that you've worked. I had no idea that you worked in these in these different mediums aside um, from from writing. Um, this is your first novel, but you've published many poems, short stories. You've done translations. You've written. You've directed plays, and you're also an academic scholar. Um, what did the novel allow you to do that other genres might not have? So the novel, um, I'm always working out the same thing. I, I feel like, you know, and it's always the same story, 
it's just you know different part different parts of it so whether you know whether it's a it's a play or it's a um, not necessarily poetry, actually. Poetry, I think, allows me to venture out a little bit more, but plays and um, so sh play, shorter fiction, um, that kind of thing. Um, I, I focus on these stories um, that I want to tell about, about Cuba. The novel is something so, so different. And I think, you know, definitely the dissertation prepares you for it. In, in so many ways, it's, it's um, such amazing training because, um, you know, it takes discipline. It takes, um, it, it takes a very long time, <laughs> right? Um, you rely on other people to, to give you feedback. You definitely can't do it alone. You can't write a dissertation alone. And so um, the novel, you know, I was prepared for it in that sense. I had... Um, I have very good discipline. When I start a project, I'm, I'm very obsessive about it and I get to the end, whatever it is and however it comes out, but I get to the end. So in that sense, um, it, was, it was easy, but um, the novel started as a short story that I published. I had actually, many, many years ago, I wrote a short story um, and I actually workshopped the story with the other Christina Garcia, <laughs> <laughs> your literary sister. Right. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know, she she really liked it, and she gave me some feedback. And then I was in, um, I workshopped parts of that story um, at an Iowa um, writing workshop, University of Iowa writing mm -hmm. workshop that I took. And someone, I, I have no idea who it was because this was an online workshop, said this should be these these characters are meant for a novel. I had never thought about that. I thought whatever I would publish first in, in terms of fiction would be um, short stories, a collection of short stories. And I have many. And so now it happens that those stories are in this novel. Mm -hmm. um, those are the characters, many of the characters that are in the novel. And, um, you know, I, I took that person's word for it. And I, and I said, you're right. Because what happened was that the, the short story in many ways um, wasn't enough. And I think when you write a short story, you have a limited amount of time, um, a limited amount of space to say things, right? And the kinds of problems that I needed to, the kinds of questions that I had um, were about much bigger problems, bigger problems that then um, could be solved in um, in a few days or a few, you know, the few, the few days that um, or, or the few weeks that a short story might uh, might cover, and so, you know, the novel was the novel is made for that. The novel is made to follow a character through decades, and that's what I wanted to do. Of course, in this novel, um, there are gaps, right? Um, I focus on very specific moments in in the history of the island, um, and those moments are, of course, the the the. 1959 Cuban Revolution, the, the very beginning of the Cuban Revolution, and um, then we have the the early years, the Mariel boat lift, um, and then the special period in times of peace. So, um, very difficult moments for for the island for the Cuban people, um, but that need to be need to be examined. The characters, um, we need to see where they came from to understand where they're going. Right, and a short story wouldn't have allowed for that. Mm -hmm. um, there is here, I think, a kind of cinematic feel to to the novel. Maybe you disagree. Um, I that at times, you know, you can uh, you can see there's there's a kind of um, in the dialogue where where theater may seep in a little bit, right? Where I at least for me, I could envision this on stage. Yeah. I thought I saw more. Sorry, I it felt there yeah. were parts that felt more like stage. Sorry. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you can't get away if if you're mm -hmm. working in other genres. Of course, they're going to inform whatever it is that you do. But yeah. this has allowed me to say, you know, so so much about what I wanted to say about the characters, about the island. Not all, of course. You know. Sure. Um, not comprehensive, but. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't have been able to do this in a poem. Um, it's informed by so much research. So scholarly work was really important. 
um, to this. And I, I see them in many ways as, as one and the same, right? You said that one of your favorite novels is Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. What did you learn from Morrison and from this novel in particular? Is Morrison a kind of standard? Do you go back to it often? Um, Morrison, or the bluest novel in particular, breaks my heart um, every time I read it. And I, I teach it a lot um, because I love it, because I think that the students learn so much from, from um, the protagonist, this, this uh, little girl named Pecola. Um, who, who thinks she's, uh, she's been told she's ugly um, throughout her life. Everything in her life um, tells her that she's ugly. The images that she sees on TV tell her that they're ugly. And her name, of course, is Pecola or Pecas or Freckles, the stains, right? Um, so she's a stain or, or a scribble, you know. Um, and, uh, and Morrison, there's so much poetry in her prose and she uses th this gorgeous, gorgeous language to talk about the most um, devastating circumstances, you know, the destruction, the actual destruction of this, of this little girl. So to me, um, because I love language um, and, and I love beautiful language, I, I thought that the, one of the things that, you know, there, there's, She's a little bit experimental in the novel, as in this novel in particular as well, and it's not um, it's not a thriller. So you're not you know it's not a huge page turner in many ways, but the language is enchanting. It, there's a kind of a, a process of incantation when you read her work, and you become enmeshed with the language and with the characters, and so. Um, I, I have loved her since since the very first time I, I uh, read the book, and um, yeah, she's she's become a kind of, of standard for me, I, I suppose. And I, I think there are moments, there are echoes here in some ways of of um, Morrison in a very, very humble um, my, in my humble version, right? But um, you know, in Maria's fascination for for the Sears images, the Sears catalog. Um, we see some of that in the characters of um, the bluest eye. And I would, I, sorry, I was just, no, no, no. when you were saying that there are um, moments that are so destructive, but that she is weaves in such a poetic way, um, that in really beautiful language. I mean, that, Susanna, that, that's in your novel. I mean, I, I do think that there's definitely those, those moments. Thank you, Christine. Yeah. And actually, would you would you read another passage for us? Yeah. Um, how about you know the novels based in about that? But we, there's also these fabulous vignettes in Chicago, and it's snow. Um, maybe read us a passage about Ricky Perez. Okay, so I love uh, I love Ricky. Um, Ricky, uh, should I talk a little bit about how Ricky came about? Or? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. So Ricky wasn't always. We don't. We didn't always see Ricky. We only heard Ricky um, in the earlier drafts of the novel, um, and you know we would hear him through the phone the few times that that he would call Elio. And um, I had a, a wonderful friend who suggested, um, "How about if we saw him right at at some point?" And I said, "Hmm." Let me see, right? And I, I played around with the idea. I, I wrote a little, you know, a very short vignette about Ricky. And I just, I fell in love with Ricky and I had given him a girlfriend, Sally. And um, I fell in love with Sally and it did wonderful things for, for the novel. I think it, it opened up this window to the outside world that we didn't really have um, before. And so um, that's how Ricky came about. And Ricky, uh, Ricky loves the theater. We don't see it here, but he, he loves the theater and he dreamed of, of um, he dreamed of playing, uh, or actually he ended up playing Willie Loman um, or a stand in for Willie Loman um, in, uh, in one of the vignettes. Okay, so this one takes place in 1994, it's chapter 31, um, and uh, it's in Chicago. So it says, a blizzard was raging outside as Ricky Perez stood by his front window to watch the air stiffen with snow through a near frosted glass pane. 
Beyond his windowsill, the pavement had disappeared under a thick white cushion. The snow fell more and more heavily and it was getting dark. The streets were almost empty. It was a Saturday and those who'd been unlucky enough to be caught in the blizzard fled into the side streets or took refuge inside shops and restaurants. He'd been waiting for Sally since the morning, but when the blizzards broke suddenly like a cold shiver, he'd given up. He passed the time eating Marushan ramen noodles from Jules and watching Ricky Ricardo on TV. He might have thought it was the coldest day ever in Chicago, but he knew better. He'd been there long enough to know that the temperature could drop to a numbing 21 degrees below zero faster than he could shout, I'm Cuban. And how does a Cuban bread on mangoes, scorching heat and white sand beaches brave the storm? He stays put and reimagines Chicago in the sun. Ricky cast his eyes over to a small picture frame hanging on the wall. A mustached man dressed in light summer clothing, Panama hat, with a snap brim shaped like a fedora and a narrow black hat band, stands beside a scrawny boy in short trouser pants, suspenders, and a flat, light-colored ivy hat. Behind them, the avenue of flags. Ricky looked closely at the picture, remembering the warmth of the midday sunlight on his bare arms and the blind, blinding sun rays all around, casting giant shadows of the flags at the open-air exhibition sites. It was 1933 and the height of the Great Depression. He, Ricky Paris, held his father's hand and strolled through the Grand Avenue of Flags at Chicago's A Center of Progress World Fair. This was the city's second fair held on Northerly Island in the Burnham Park Harbor area, just southeast of the main downtown district. All Ricky had to do was close his eyes and he could hear it all now in Dolby Stereo. Ladies and gentlemen, Chicagoans, world folk, here we are at Chicago's world-famed Century of Progress, a spectacular fair that was started from a beam of light from the star Arcturus. People from all over the world have come to see its magic and its marvels. No less than 22 million of you come swarming into this colossal show to witness the brilliant handiwork of its modern, unparalleled ingenuity. Here's the famous Avenue of Flags, a beautiful flag-bedecked boulevard filled with an endless stream of pleasure seekers in gay attire, full of the holiday mood, keying their spirits to the glitter and sparkle of their surrounding, eager participants in the sweet glory of a show unmatched in the annals of fair making. Only in El Norte, right, Ricky? His father had asked, squeezing his hand. These Americans are something else. Money's freedom, Ricky, the only real freedom there is. El Norte has always been our North Star. Cubans were born looking north. That had been it. All Ricky had to do then was look up at the Ferris giant Ferris wheel and know that this was the place everyone should go. He had been dream bitten and his appetite for American streets, department stores and skyscrapers with their slants of light and sparkling glass windows was insatiable. It had been a yearning to be surrounded by Norte Americanos. It may even have been a need to lose himself in their company to start over. But Ricky never had any money to speak of. In fact, one of his greatest regrets was not being able to help Elio like he'd always wanted to, like his son deserved. The lottery was no good. No large sum of money ever made its way to him, even when Walter Mercado came on the Spanish channel and said, Libra. Today, the sun enters dramatically in your sign. This is your time, and these are your lucky numbers. Don't let them go to waste, Libra. Ricky stared at his TV as the numbers popped up on the screen one by one. 11, 64, 22, 3, 42, 37. But although he'd spent his last $50 on tickets, not a single number came up, not a single one. During the first years in the heart of America, he'd been forced to juggle several jobs. Short order cook, security guard, and janitor to name a few. He'd ended up with the janitor job because, well, they kept him and also because at least he was cleaning a theater and not some grimy subway bathroom. In any case, he'd sent Elio money, not a lot, but he could manage, damn it. Did anyone ever write back to ask where all the money was coming from? He sent money even when he'd been wary of sending money directly to Elio's address for fear that the envelope would be open and the sum, however small, confiscated. But he didn't know anybody who could, perhaps as a favor, perhaps for a small fee, take it to Cuba for him. It wasn't as though Chicago were Miami, where everybody was Cuban, along with the crackers, the coffee, and the cat. He was ashamed and regretted that he hadn't been able to do more, but he did what he could, Carajo. He thought he sent the money any way he could. 
He looked at his window again for a moment. He imagined that a bright sun had thawed and melted all the snow on the street. Ricky felt as if he too were melting in the sunlight. Um, one final question, Susanna, before we okay. open it up to the audience. You are faculty in the writing programs at UCLA. Does what you have to say to students change after the publication of Until We're Fish? Do you have anything special to say to students now that you have a novel behind you? Sure, um, I, think, I, I think there's some students in the audience. Um, I wanna say take heart, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, writing is hard. It, it is not um, something that you do overnight. It's not something that you can do the night before um, we hammer this to our students and, and that is, it's, it's a process. And one thing that I like to tell my students all the time, and I told them this before the novel, and I say it after the novel with even um, much, more, um, much more certainty, and that is that you may write on your own, um, but you revise in the company of others. And so um, having someone to look at your work, having a community that supports you, um, is instrumental to anything that you want to do and to writing in particular. Short and sweet, that's all I have. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Because we often think of writing as this solitary process. We don't recognize like that there's a community of writers and that it's actually quite collaborative. Um, yeah, so we'll take questions, questions from the audience. Susanna, you had, um, going back to this idea, I love the association that you made. It, it, it came to su such a surprise that you would associate the process of the novel with the process of the dissertation. <laughs> um, aside from what you also referenced uh, certain individuals that told you um, to, develop, to develop certain characters. What role did other individuals have as far as like editors and cutting or expanding? Um, huge. I mean, I, I didn't necessarily show the novel to too many people at, at the very beginning. I was, I was protective of it in so many ways, but I talked about it all the time. Um, even talking to my, my family was extremely important. Um, and, um, I had, I, I had the, the fortune to work as, um, the literary assistant to North American writer Mona Simpson. Um, for some time. And um, one of the things, you know, when I told her I'm, I'm writing this novel, one of the first things that she asked me was, do you have a writing group? Um, mm -hmm. And that was really super, super important to the decisions that I made from that point forward. I went out and, you know, when, when someone who has published a great deal and has been very successful at it gives you advice, you take it. Right. <laughs> you don't question, right? <laughs> And so I said, I got to go out and find me a, a writing group. And, and I did, and they were instrumental in the, not necessarily the shaping of the novel, but with, with encouragement, with the moving forward. And we would meet every so often. And uh, this was before COVID, right? But right. Uh, we had our Facebook group. We've never met in person. And so um, we would exchange chapters and we were at different stages, which was really helpful um, you know, people had different strengths and all of that, that you get from, from a writing group. And so, um, that was wonderful. Um, of course I, I had that, that, uh, that early mentorship, um, you know, in the form of the, the short story that, that, uh, led to the book from, uh, from Christina Garcia, um, and, and other people who, though they have, uh, not people who have read the book, you've read an early version of mm -hmm. the book. Um, so that was, uh, that was really a gift. Sometimes you don't know what you're putting out there. So even, even a small word of, of encouragement makes a whole world of difference. And so, um, and you had more than a few words, so that was nice. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, fr from, from that time to where we are today, uh, many months, you know, in a few years, um, went by. And so, I mean, mentors come in all shapes. Toni Morrison was a mentor. All the books that I read before um, were in some way 
um, mentoring me all, all along. I feel people that that you meet that read something small that that um, you wrote. There are people I think uh, present in the audience who have been great mentors um, to me. And so um, I am thankful for all of it. And like I said, my message to the students, you can't simply do anything. You can't publish anything um, alone. You need those mentors. You need people sort of holding you up um, all along or it's, it's impossible. And that whole idea of the lonely um, writer sitting at, uh, at her desk, you know, mm -hmm. tapping away at her keys, um, yeah, it, it happens once in a while, but the real work begins when people give you feedback. Um, and for me, for example, working with an editor was pure joy um, because yeah. that's when really your work begins to shine, when, when you work with an editor closely and you trust their feedback. Right, that's fantastic. Um, we have a couple questions. Um, perhaps this is, uh, hi, Professor Drisi, which character do you connect with most in the novel? Oh, that's nice. Who's that? Let's see. Hannah M. Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Um, so which character do I connect most with? Um, I love that. I mean, I love them all. I, I have to say it's like uh, your kids. You never say which one's your favorite. Um, <laughs> right. I, I love them all. Even the ones that I don't like, I like, right? Because you, <laughs> um, you, you birth them. So <laughs> one character, and she's not a main character, but one character who really stuck with me and she had a tiny little role and she, it was almost like she begged to be more. Um, mm -hmm. And I couldn't deny her um, was Isabelita, um, which you'll get, you know, if you get far enough into the book, you'll get to meet her. And, um, she she's a hairstylist. She hasn't been trained officially, but she's a she cuts hair, and um, she you know she dreams of leaving to Miami and and working for rich Cuban women's in which rich Cuban women's houses and doing their flower and cutting their hair and at, at some point she even thinks stealing their husbands, but then she says no no she's not right. a home record. <laughs> um, so Isabelita was was wonderful. She's extremely natural. Um, she says what she thinks, um, very transparent and just, just lovely. I mean, um, a lovely character. I, I miss her dearly because I, I felt while working on the book, mm -hmm. um, it's, you get to visit this place every day, right? If you're working on it every day, you get to visit this place. And all of a sudden that, that place is no longer there um in the way that it used to be you miss you miss your characters you you miss your your people that's so interesting to hear because i always feel so like a little bit and i know that this is something that other people have expressed but sadness when you get to the end of a novel that you really mm. enjoy because you can't you can't go back to it of course it stays with you um but i guess even to a larger degree the person who created <laughs> that world would even have would miss them yeah and you have some so many hopes and dreams for these characters and some that are that are never possible in the world of the novel right. so they break your you know they break your heart or decisions that the characters have to make that um that are difficult difficult decisions that you don't want them ultimately to make but that you know it's the right thing to do for the story and and right. for the character yeah. Right, right. Well, on the on the topic of character, you you have another question, and I, and I'm curious about this too because you said your mom was a librarian, and I'm thinking of a character in the book. But um, Gabby is, would like to know: Are your characters in the book based on real people? Yes, yes, they are. Um, that doesn't mean that they are inspired by real people. That does not mean, the librarian is definitely not my mom. My mom was not that kind of librarian. Um, my mom was very kind, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> look, uh, Elio, and, Elio and Maria, um, I don't wanna get, I've, I've been super emotional since the, the beginning of the day looking forward looking forward to this moment because um you know it's it's been a long it's been a long process and i think for for latino writers in particular minority writers it's extremely challenging to bring a novel forth into 
into the world. You know, there isn't the same kind of, of support or, or distribution for women to, and so um, I've been I've been um, emotional. Now I, I lost track of what I was going to say. Oh, about the the characters. So mm -hmm. the characters Maria and Elio, um, they are very much real people. Um, they were husband and wife. Maria um, was my um, great aunt, you know, um, who I never got to see again, you know. So for me, and, and, and she, she worked at the Telefonica for some time, um, I believe, and um, she loved typewriters and telephones and um, knew some English. And she was just fabulous, you know, fabulous and, and amazing, you know. In, in many ways. And so she's, she's there, you know, in some ways it's, it's not, it's not my aunt Maria, right. you know, for sure. It's, it's someone else, but she was inspired by that. And Elio was her husband who was, who was obsessed with fish. You know, <laughs> Elio had aquariums all over his house and the, the house itself had become a large aquarium. So if you went into the house, he had heaps of of materials for the aquariums and I go in the back and he had all the fish and you can sort of smell the, the live fish. And, um, he had like a mossy kind of cement configuration where he, he would put some of the fish and then, um, the makeshift aquariums that he had. Um, he was very crafty. Kids loved him. Um, he, he attracted a lot of a lot of children and um, had been to the United States before um, as well. And so these are a few people. My grandmother is in there. Um, my dad is in there in, in some of the, the sadder in some of the sadder scenes, you know, when Elio, for example, is is being chased um, by government uh, people in the car and he's on the bike. Um, we're all there in, in some way, right? We're there hiding under the bed when the, the rallies and people are marching on our houses. Um, that's us, you know? Mm -hmm. So in, in some way, this is, this is a novel about all the people that I know, you know, both who are part of my family and who are not part of the family, um, good and bad, you know, people who were, who were forced to be bad at a time when, um, things were very difficult, who, um, who we have a difficult time forgiving, you know, um, but who I ultimately tend to understand in spite of the fact that um, they could have chosen a different way of, of dealing with the, with the situation. You know, there's this whole neighbor against neighbor in the, in the novel. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's peopled by everyone I know, everyone mm -hmm. I know. And, and this is why it's hard to not love every character, you know, every right. flaw, every, every little bit of every gesture. Yeah. Cause I think there's, there's often reference to yeah. individuals that do things that surprise him, but that were good in quote, you know, that, that, that the certain co the conditions created that, that moved to people or forced them or felt that they were forced to behave in certain ways. Um, We've got a question from Marlene. What do you hope your readers take away from this book? I hope readers, Marlene, I hope readers take away from, from the book um, that, um, you know, that even, even in the most difficult of circumstances, people, not only Cubans, you know, people in general um, can be resilient, can, um, nurture their passions and their dreams, that making plans um, at a time when plans are impossible to keep or, or plans are an impossibility, it's one of the most important things in the world. I mean, we're, we're made to, I, I tell my students, and I begin with, uh, with a book called Wired for Story, right? And so as human beings, we're wired for story, wired for storytelling. It allows us to see in many ways into the future and what we're capable of. And so all of these characters, to go back to that early question, um, Christina, the, all of these characters um, have these stories that help them overcome in some way, mm -hmm. you know, however, even if it's for a short period of time, you know, 
um, it's nourishment um, for them. So Marlene, I would say um, what I want people to take away uh, from the story is one that, that um, as very basic as this may, may be, dreams are important, right? Whatever, whatever dream you may have, it's, it's almost a lot more fun to chase than dr the dream than to have the dream fulfilled, right? So um, the, the journey versus the, the destination. And, and uh, if you read to the end of the book, you'll see that this is true, that the journey is absolutely everything. And, um, and also that, you know, the, the Cuban situation is, is, uh, has been extremely complex. It has broken up families. It has uh, broken many hearts, you know, um, and, uh, but we're here, we're not going anywhere. Not sure, maybe you'll understand the reference. Would you describe your novel as a one and a half? Oh, who's asking this question? Ariana? Ariana. Um, hi, Ariana. Would you describe, um, would I describe it as a one and a half? Um, like from, from the perspective of, is this, is this the consequence of a one and a half -er? Is that what she means? I'm not sure. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's this, I'll take it as that. So there is, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, there is this need in the novel from the very beginning to stand in the middle, you know, to, you know, too close and you can't see the picture, too far and you can't see the picture. And so somewhere in the middle is the right perspective. And yes, as a one and a half generation, which means that I was born in Cuba, but came of age in the United States, I feel like um, I feel like I have that that double lens, the, the lens of the, the, the once insider and the lens of the outsider. So I, it allows me to to talk about um, to talk about Cuba, I think, from from a different a different angle, the, the angle of the person who is in the middle. And even even when Elio goes to the theater, for example, when he's in Havana, we get an indication of this need that he has or or the understanding that he, he has that this middle position um, can be fruitful in some way or can bring some kind of um, can shed some light into the situation. If you're, if you're inside this situation, right, you're blind to it. You're trying to survive the everyday. Mm -hmm. If you're too far, like his dad, you simply don't understand what's going on in the island. But if you're somewhere in between, if, if you, you know, if you're somewhere between uh, that, that place abroad and the island, for example, which in this case would be the sea, right? Um, then there's a greater understanding and that's that position is not only the position of a one and a half -er, but also a position of someone who has been trained as in comparative literature so i feel <laughs> i feel that um you, you know ha, ha, i have this kind of, of training and it's not only the middle position but also sort of the eagles i view that I, I try to in some way um bring not necessarily effectively because at the end of the day i'm talking about my my people and my country right um, so I'm, I'm very emotionally and psychologically invested in the story, but um, this one and a half position that I tell the story from um, allows me a certain a certain freedom and a little bit of a little bit of distance, even if it's not too much distance. It's uh, it's a little bit. And I always remember, um, you know, writer and ethnographer Zora Neale Hurston. Um, I don't know if you've ever read Mules and, and Men when she goes back and Ariana maybe familiar with this when she goes back to Eatonville to collect the the folk tales and um, you know she realizes that she has this kind of double vision outsider insider um, and so I'm hoping that I do bring that to to the novel great question <laughs> So I think that's all of our questions unless anybody else wants to post something And I had a student earlier that asked, will I sign the book if they buy one? And of course, yeah. <laughs> oh. 
Wonderful. Um, if if you do want to come to the store and sign, we can coordinate that. So I'll I'd love to. Yeah, okay. I think a few people would want that. Yeah, perfect. So I'll email you about that later. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for joining us tonight. This was such a beautiful event. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Christina. Congratulations thank on you both. And everyone, thank you so much for watching. And thank you to Ricardo again and Makina Loca for joining us and presenting us with their beautiful music. And also reminder that you can get the book at the green button below and that Ricardo has a new album. And thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Christina, Samantha. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.